Hello and welcome everybody to this edition of Coach Vogelai's Corner. I'm David Stearns, joined with Coach Vogelai over the phone. Coach, we need to talk. This past weekend, you saw a split in your own barn, and that rarely happens. Uh, why don't you talk to us in general what happened this past weekend, and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of each game. So, have at it, Coach. You know, hey, thanks for having me. It's you know, this past weekend we saw a lot of the ups and downs. We had a great atmosphere on Saturday for homecoming with Virginia Tech coming in. Um, you know, you guys were in the house. The band was great. They were there. Uh, we had a nice crowd. It was. Uh, I, I think everybody that was at the game had a had a, had a great treat. Um, Sunday, unfortunately, you know what? We did something that we don't do very often. That's lose at home. Um, so it, it was an unfortunate. I think a lot of it was the preparation, but. You know, we're going to have to bust back. We're going to have to get back at it this weekend for a big rivalry with Maryland. Now, uh, starting off with the Virginia Tech game, you know, it was a, a, the homecoming game. As you alluded to before, you had the band in the house. Uh, a, a nice turnout as well. Um, a good back-and-forth showing. And this Virginia Tech team, we, we've seen them, you know, in a few contests already this year. Uh, they can contend, and they can also struggle, but uh, where do you ultimately see them? Because uh, as I'm seeing it here, I'm trying to figure out the southeast picture and uh, also the, the, the match, too, I'm trying to figure out where things lie. Where do you see Virginia Tech uh, in the whole grand scheme of things? You know, I think if you take them, if you take their league, the Mid-Atlantic South, I think they're probably going to finish second. Um I think I mean they've already got a win over Delaware, and I think Delaware surprised some people this past weekend. And then you've got uh, Liberty, which I think is down a little bit this year. I mean they've beaten some teams by some big numbers, but uh, you know, really got to look at the competition first. And you know, I, I so I think they're going to finish second in the, in the realm of the Southeast. I think everything's going to get ironed out here in the next couple of weeks to the next month or so. Um, and I think they're going to be a five-six team. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to get much higher than that. I don't think they're going to be able to surpass us or Florida Gulf Coast or Bowling Green or Penn State. So, uh, but it's possible they play Penn State coming up here in a couple of, in, in I think in two weeks. So, it is possible. I mean, they're they're a good hockey team. Um, they've got you know good goaltending. They're they're built on speed and throwing everything at the net at this level. You throw enough pucks at the net and you go hard enough to it. You know you're gonna you're gonna get some goals, and if you're fast enough and can contain that, and you know and be fast enough for the entire 60 minutes of the game, and keep driving wide and keep doing those kinds of things, you're gonna wear teams out, and that's what they do. So, you know they're gonna be a good team. Um, you know I still think that they're you know a couple guys away and things like that, but you know they're gonna be tough to beat coming the end of the year. Now talk a little bit about that game. Uh, I started out. Uh... Well, a rocky first period, plenty of penalties uh, on your side of the score sheet, and uh, but fortunate to walk away with a nothing nothing score, and then four goals, uh, two aside in the second, and then the game winner with Bloom in the third. Uh, how did, in your mind, how did that game play out for you? I mean, Virginia Tech does bring a physical game, and they also take uh, plenty of shots. Uh, what was what was your impression from your side of the bench? You know, I thought we did a, a decent job. I, I, haven't, I don't think that we've played that one game yet that I can say that we did a great job. Um, but we did a decent job keeping them to the outside. That was the game plan. We knew they were fast. Um, and we, and us being as young as we are, um, it was going to be a learning experience coming out of a three-loss a three loss weekend the week before that at the showcase where we kind of got to see what they had. You know, we knew that, if we kept them to the outside, that we would do that. I, I think we would be fine. Um, you know, and their only goals were the one, were the you know two or three times that we let them, you know, in from that outside. So one of them was on an on man rush. But you know, I thought the first period went okay, other than how many penalties we took. So we corrected that, um, and we became a little bit more disciplined after the first period. Um, you know, and then we got our power play chances, you know, later on in the game, and you know, we cashed in on one of them. So. You know, it worked. It worked out to our advantage, but you know, I thought I thought we did a decent job doing, you know, and executing our game plan. You know, and I'm just thankful that we came up with a victory on that one. A little frustration from Virginia Tech at the end there, and uh, 
the hands came up in the faces and gloves were being dropped, but nothing came of it in the score sheet sense of the the whole thing. But uh, it definitely sets the tone, I think, for the game in January, uh, where you have the uh, two-game weekend down in Southern Virginia, of course, starting out with Virginia Tech and then leading into Liberty. Uh, how do you see this game translating in the minds of your guys uh, leading into that second game well into the future about, what, four, three, three or four months from now? No, I, I think it'll carry over. I think, you know, the, the rivalry of, of the game itself will carry over. The fisticuffs or the, the, the disagreement, so to speak, at the end of the game, it'll all be long forgotten. I mean, one of their captains came up to me after the game and came up and shook my hand. It's a great game, terrible ending, but great game. And we are we had just as much to do with that as anybody else. So, you know, we apologize. So, you know, I, I, think, I think both teams understand that it was frustration and, just a lot of testosterone going out on the ice and, you know, half the, you know, I'm sure my guys had, had a couple things to say and I'm sure that escalated things. And, you know, it, it, these things unfortunately happen. So, you know, we punished a couple of our guys for it and just kind of, kind of set the precedent that that's not how we, how we run things here at UMBC. But, you know, so I think it'll be a learning experience and I think both teams are going to be hungry for the win. They're not going to want to get swept again. We're going to want to go down there and set the record straight that we are better than them, and we're going to beat them in front of their big crowd. Now, moving into Sunday's game, you guys were high off the homecoming victory the night before against Virginia Tech, and then you had the Montclair State University Red Hawks come in. Uh, polar opposites, uh, I think, between Saturday's game and Sunday's game, but uh, why don't you describe to us in your words uh, what – what happened in that seven to five loss? Yeah, I think it all starts with the preparation. And we just didn't come ready to play. We certainly didn't come ready to play some of the talented forwards that Montclair has, and you know, and we certainly didn't come to play the uh, you know the for the with the mental toughness it takes to to play at this level. I mean, the teams that you're going to play night in and night out, they're going to be really tough. You know, they're going to be they're going to have a couple forwards that can really go, and Montclair's got one. You got got a couple of them. You know, they got you know their their leading goal scorer played at Del Barton, maybe the most prolific team in New Jersey, high school team in New Jersey. And they got another forward that's an NCAA D3 transfer that played in the USHL. You can't take night off nights off when you play against kids with this kind of talent, and they're well coached. They've got uh, they've got some they've got some holes, and I think we should have done a better job of exploiting them. But you know, we just we just didn't want it more than they did that, that night. So. We end up with a loss. There was a couple of, uh, actually, there was a few factors in this game that uh, I noticed that may have um, held you guys back quite a bit. Uh, well, one of them being a disallow or a goal that should have been disallowed that uh, we'll talk about in a second. But let me just talk about the other two factors before I get to that. Uh, Preziosi and Lieback were probably two uh, two players for the Red Hawks that were pretty much all over you guys and uh preziosi of course being the ncaa uh d3 player you had uh talked about but uh talk about their style of play uh you mentioned that they they only have a few holes in their system but uh these two players seem to be the backbone of, of this team you know yeah i mean they've done a great job of put, putting together four lines that can play and you know that's they've got really nice depth up front they've got a you know they're 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 a little bit weaker on the backside in their goaltending, but you know a lot of teams a lot of teams are that way. But if you can put four lines and you've got a couple guys that can do that, lineback had a great game up against us. Um, you know, it, it, and obviously the Prez, I mean, he's he's good. He's good. He's averaging over a goal a game as it is, so he's going to have a really good year. But you know, we've got to do a better job. You, you can't be worried about what they do all the time. You really have got to. You've got to be better with with what we do. If we play our game, this stuff, this kind of stuff, doesn't happen. Now they seem to put a lot of pressure on Drago, and they found some gaps to get through. Uh, definitely a systematic breakdown from what you guys had brought on Saturday, keeping Virginia Tech to the outside and making them take the long shots from the perimeter. But it seemed like Montclair seemed to. Um, find these gaps and, and, and definitely had a lot of odd man rushes uh, go in their favor, which resulted in a few goals. Uh, talk about Drago under, pre uh, under pressure here because uh, it didn't seem like he got much support from the back line, uh, the blue line from you guys. 
Uh, your defenseman kind of left him hanging out to dry, but uh, talk about your impression of uh, his play in that game versus Saturday. You know, the, you, no matter what position you play, whether it's goaltender, defenseman, or forwards, you're going to have your great nights and you're going to have your bad nights. Plain and simple, it's just the way it, just the way this goes with this age group, with just this game. And, you know, John, Johnny had one of those nights where, you know, most times, you know, on, on their on their third goal, um, shot came in from the right side, from the outside, they hit him in the blocker. Usually that puck goes 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 up against the glass or into the corner. This time it barely barely hits his blocker and drops right to his feet, and the guy taps it in. I mean, those goals do not happen up against us. You know, they just don't happen up against Johnny. And I, mean, I was talking to him after the game, and he was visibly upset. Uh, it's just something that he takes very seriously, and you know the way he plays is is huge for him. And you know he he just said, "I'm just I'm I'm angry. Everything I tried to do tonight just didn't work, and the puck ended up in the back of my net." And you just gotta you've got to reassure him that you know, these nights are going to happen, and the next time he goes out there, the things that he's going to try are going to work. So. You know, he'll he'll be fine at the end of the day, and you know we'll move on and we'll take it as a learning experience. But I really don't credit him to much fault, at any if, if any, at this point, just because, like you said, he did get hung up to dry not only by his defenseman but also by the forward. So his whole team, you know, just didn't play very well in front of him in any aspect of the game. Now there was the uh, controversial goal that was called, and um, it, it, just clearly rang off the pipe, and uh, for those that did watch the game, probably hit the rewind button quite a few times uh, afterwards when it was posted on YouTube. Uh, don't worry, folks. The high-definition version of that game will be uploaded soon along with Virginia Tech. But uh, regardless, um, that goal seemed to be right at a, at a pivotal point in the game. Um, the second period, we saw a plethora of goals, but this being one of them. Uh, I believe this one took the lead into the locker room for Montclair at the end of that second period. Uh, talk about how that goal may or may not have impacted uh, the game and the way it concluded. You know, I, I think you really got to learn as a hockey team just to let things go, and I think we did it okay when we did come back to tie it and things like that. But, you know, it, it they're they're kids. They're young adults. They're they're gonna make mistakes, and you know the, these kinds of things are going to, you know, have an effect on them. And it's gonna get their frustration level up, and that's gonna take away from, you know, them being able to do their job to the best of their ability. So, can I say it had an effect on us? Absolutely. Um, I wish it hadn't, but it did. So, but we had also recovered from it, and you know it is what it is. I mean, the, the biggest part of it, you know, is. Bloom scores the goal to make it 6-5 um, late in the game on the power play. If, that's, if that goal is disallowed like we think it should have been, well, now it's 5-5 five, five and we can play a completely different style instead of continuously to push for that for that tying sixth goal. So it, 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 it definitely had its effect, but at the same point in time, we, it, we should have never given up you know, the other five goals to start with. So now burying this one in the yard uh, and moving forward, you have two games coming up here against Maryland, um, and two weeks before the ranking period concludes in the first set, um, how do you, uh, I guess, how, where do you see your team fitting right now? Granted, you do have Maryland for the next two, and then after that you have Delaware, and uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the second game that weekend, but um, regardless... Maryland coming up, and then this kind of rocky back and forth start you've had. Uh, where, where do you see you guys going into this weekend against Maryland? Are you are you hitting the reset button, or are you just going to charge forward with what you've been doing right now, and hoping that it just kind of regains traction? What are you? What is your approach to this coming weekend? We went. We started. You know, we we kind of analyzed this past weekend and figured out there's obviously a lot of things that we can fix and. Um, you know, it's start, definitely starting in our own end. So we, we went back to basics. You know, we got to learn how to play better in our own end, and we need to get back to the mentality that, you know what, we're one of the best teams, you know, in this, in, in, the, in this league, in this region, um, you know, and in the country. Let's face it. I mean, we've had a great track record. So, 
you know, we need to get back to that. And to do that, we need to start taking pride and not giving up goals and, you know, letting our letting our offense speak for itself, but really protecting our own end a little bit better than we have. Um, so we went back to the basics and started working on that. So we're hoping to kind of hit the reset button. We knew that the first seven games were going to be very, very difficult. So uh, set it up that way. You know, we you know, it always seems that the guys listen a little bit more when – and they lose, so they don't know everything, and you know they think they can just kind of float on by. So you know, we're going to work. You know, we got back to the basics, like I said, and we're going to work extremely hard. And I think we're going to see some positive results after after this weekend on our you know our rival. We have UMBC is 17 and seven overall, and you know over over Maryland, and you know, we haven't lost in the last eight years to them. So we're looking to keep that that streak alive for sure. And then the following weekend, you've got Delaware and our rematch with Montclair State. Yep, there it is. <laughs> and uh, you know we're we're going to look to have you know get get some get, get some revenge on them. And let's not forget about Delaware; they just did beat Penn State, so they're going to be tough as well. Um, so I think at the end of the day, if we if we take care of what we should take care of, which is all four of these games, um, you know we'll be or we'll be seven and four. After the first ranking period, with all four losses coming to teams that haven't lost in regulation yet, only only Montclair State has um, a loss in overtime, but Miami hasn't lost. Southern Illinois is nine and zero right now. Grand Valley still hasn't lost. They have a tie, but that's it. Um, so, you know, and that and that was to Siena that we beat so twice. So, right. uh, you know, we. I mean, our losses are bad because I think we could have beaten a couple of those teams, but at the same point in time, there's, there's a teams that haven't lost yet. So, you know, you can't really argue with that. I mean, Southern Illinois is going to be, if they're not two, they're going to be three in the central grand Valley. If they're not two, they're going to be three in the central. Um, cause I think Michigan state's probably going to take the number one spot. Um, but you know, Montclair is going to be probably, Two or three in the in the northeast, so it's not the end of the world, that's for sure. Yeah, um, and it's yeah. so early that we can we can definitely bounce back. We just need to figure. We just need to fix what we're doing and be and get back to the, you know playing UMBC hockey. Well, the battle of '95 will commence. I don't know what do we call it—the battle of the '95 or battle of the Beltways? What do we have a term for this one? Is it the battle of the Beltways? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it would have to be. Yeah, because I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm assuming that Laurel would considerably be closer to DC, and your team, well, obviously on the doorstep of Baltimore. So I guess the Battle of the Beltways will take place this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely. Well. So a home and home is what we got ahead here. Uh, Maryland, it'll, they'll host the first game on the 20th, and that'll be at the Gardens Ice House in Laurel, Maryland, at 3:50, and then. You guys will host the second game on Sunday at 5.15 up there at Reisterstown Sportsplex. Well, Coach, good luck this coming weekend, and hopefully that reset button is fine-tuned and you guys make the right resets where you need to. Thank you. All right, so our next broadcast, as we remind you, is on October 27th when the Delaware Blue Hens will come to the Reisterstown Sportsplex. That broadcast will begin at 4.30 p.m., so tune in for that one. But uh, I don't know if we have any broadcast details on the Maryland UMBC games, but uh, check Twitter and your local listings, and uh, I'm sure Mr. Sean Hoppy will keep everyone apprised as to what's going on as well. Follow him at UMBC Ice Hockey on Twitter for the latest updates during the games. So for Coach Vogelize Corner, I'm David Stern saying good night, everybody, and as always, don't stop believing. Take care.